Good afternoon. Um, my name is Brian Massey, um, Member of Parliament for Windsor West, NDP critic for industry, science, technology, and the Great Lakes as well. Um, I'm here today to um, give a press conference with regard to action that we've been taking place and most specifically related to regional airports that are under the study of closure for their towers being NAV Canada uh, review that started back in November of 2020. Um, there's a number of issues that have come to light with regards to this. Uh, coming from a city of Windsor, which is one of the places that's considered uh, under the study, the others are Whitehorse, Regina, Fort McMurray, uh, Prince George, Sault Ste. Marie, and St. John in Quebec. Uh, it has been very distressing. Um, obviously, with COVID-19, there has been several challenges to our local economies. Uh, airports uh, in the airline industry obviously under siege in many respects. In fact, we still don't have specific packages for those industries. But what we do know is that those hubs uh, were downloaded to the municipal governments. So I was on Windsor City Council when that took place. Um, and there's been substantial investments in those properties, not only for keeping Canadians uh, involved in the economy and passenger and uh, corporate uh, flying, uh, but also to connecting communities like Windsor, which is the fourth most diverse in Canada to the rest of the world. And with the traffic being down, it's a challenge at the moment. But what we do know is that the public will return to air travel um, and as well to the uh, business community will as well. And those municipalities that are on those tier levels of being reduced for air traffic control um, direct service uh, is not only a bad decision for the economy, but also bad public safety uh, decisions as well, too. So when this took place, uh, like many communities in Windsor, we were explained by the federal government that this is NAV Canada's um, own decision to make. Um, forgetting that this was the actual Liberal government that actually was the one that privatized to NAV Canada from the public on that. And what they said is that uh, we had to endure the process, which is now going on for six months, uh, which could go even further because once the study is completed by NAV Canada, it's later punted to the minister and the minister reviews, perhaps doing his or her own studies, and then finally a decision comes forward. What that does is undermine public confidence and public safety, uh, but also too pr puts a lot of pressure on the municipalities and also business decisions about investment because uh, with the reduction of air traffic control direct service, uh, we see insurance rates go high uh, with regards to passenger travel. We see decisions from corporations that look for other places for investment. Uh, and in my region in Windsor, it puts you on a nervous edge because we share the airspace with five different airports and they're international in nature as well too because of the Detroit airspace. And we have had crashes in plane collisions in our past because of the complicated airspace that we do have. So with the government kind of explaining that they can't do anything about this because the legislation is such that uh, they cannot act and have to endure this process uh, wasn't satisfactory to me. And so uh, with my leader, Jagmeet Singh, uh, and the kind of the philosophy that I've grown up uh, through the party, you know, first with Alexa McDonough and later with Jack Layton, was we should be in proposition, not just opposition. And that means offering creative solutions to uh, make things different. And so what we've asked for uh, and what we actually then uh, developed was a policy to alleviate the government of this restriction. So today I tabled in the House of Commons an act to amend the Civil Air and Aviation Act uh, and Services Commercialization Act that actually allows the minister to actually not have to wait for the study, not have to wait to make a decision with regards to saying that this um, laying off and the reduction of services is in the public interest. And that allows a much more comprehensive way to be able to plan for the complications of having this uncertainty drag on for perhaps another half a year. Perhaps that's advantageous for a government that might potentially go into election, um, but it certainly is not the way that it should be done. And so my bill table today, uh, I've invited the, the minister to either steal it, um, which they have done on other pieces of legislation. Ironically, I just came from the finance committee meetings where we're studying single event sports betting, um, where they actually took my legislation um, uh, and drafted 
drafted a better piece of legislation, uh, but then backed out of that. But at any rate, we're going back to Mr. Waugh's legislation. But the point being is that we are all united to try to find a solution in moving forward. And as well, too, the, the Prime Minister could do an order in Council. And so we provided several avenues for this. If the government wanted to do it temporarily or permanently, uh, all those things are open. But there is certainly no more excuses starting today for the government not to act. Now, this issue has drawn quite a significant um, uh, support from the community. I want to thank uh, corporate pilot Dante Albano uh, for helping construct a petition privately and then another one on the public uh, through the House of Commons where over 2,200 uh, people have signed on to that petition across the country. As well, uh, Richard Bradwell, manager of Windsor Flying Airport, um, and pilot D'Souza, and as well as the Canadian Air Traffic Controllers Association, uh, as particular parties and, of course, our leadership locally, and there's been others across this country, Mayor Drew Dilkins, about this because uh, it is certainly an economic interest for all. I want to touch briefly before I conclude, though, um, that this is not just isolated. Most recently, we've seen letters of support from Green Shield Canada locally about this issue. So it is actually in there detailed in their letter talking about the loss of this would actually affect their growth, not only just in terms of our region, but across Ontario. And most recently... The Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association has actually sent a letter of support to retain the current services that we have. In conclusion, I want to thank um, all those that are interested in this matter. Uh, there's no doubt um, that there's an investment requirement uh, to make sure our airports, and especially the regional ones, are going to be uh, solid after COVID-19. Um, but it would be silly at this point to reduce services at a point in time uh, where air traffic has gone down because of COVID-19. And we've seen many, many industries uh, supported to keep those structures in place so we not do not fall ourselves further behind. And I think when you look at air traffic controllers, and we've seen this through the evidence presented even through testimony in the House of Commons committees, that our air traffic controllers are very much a value-added uh, component for our society. Uh, they're important for ourselves, not only in terms of the current structure we have, but also the future. And so reducing their trained element would be a step backwards for a profession that is very important for our Canadian society. And um, again, in conclusion, uh, this issue is certainly right now a problem solved if the government wants to proceed. I've heard from parliamentary secretaries and from others that try to hide behind the current legislation uh, right now. That excuse is now evaporated. Uh, the legislation has been drafted. It has been presented in the House of Commons. Uh, again, we are open, similar to what I've done to previous legislation, for this to be seconded by the government. Um, it also could be done through an order in council. Uh, the game should end right now, um, and we shouldn't have to go through a spring and summer with more uncertainty over a few jobs that would actually reduce the several communities, as I mentioned, with their economic and safety capabilities at a time during the pandemic. So I'm available for questions and want to thank all those that have participated to bring this issue to light, uh, because it's important, for, again, for our economy, keeping Canadians connected to their um, places around the world with their family and friends, and then also to um, uh, ensuring that this public safety is paramount when it comes to air traffic control. And we'll now take questions, starting with questions on the phone. Quick reminder, as usual, one question, one follow-up per reporter. Nous allons maintenant prendre les questions, commençons par les questions au téléphone. Un petit rappel, une question, une question de suivi par journaliste. Opératrice, avons-nous une première question? Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. And there are no questions with just Sarah this time. Nous n'avons pas de questions pour le moment. In the room. Hi, Mr. Massey. David Thornton from CBC News. I guess I don't understand what the problem is here because NAV Canada can't do anything unless they have the final sign-off from the Minister of Transportation. So... I, I guess I don't understand what, what your bill is trying to achieve here. Is it just that you want the minister, you want to give him powers to, or her, uh, powers to intervene sooner? Yes, because right now with the uncertainty of whether you'll have that traffic control will actually affect economic decisions right now and also even the airline carriers for passengers. So your insurance, without the support for that, your insurance goes up. Um, your costs go up with regards to running the airport. And then on top of that, economic investments, as I've referenced, uh, Green Shield and the auto industry are all identifying that these are important features. So what you're left with is speculative process for the next number of months, if not a year. And that uncertainty costs the uh, local municipality that's running the airport or alternatively, 
um, the entire economy uh, because we can't have that uncertainty continue itself. And then you also have people that actually start to make other decisions about where they're actually going to make those investments. So it's a huge black mark with regards to on the map for the actual community, not knowing if it's going to have that future service provision. So that's important for a community like myself, when you have tool and die mold making, for example, like the Antonoff used to fly into Windsor, for the tool and die mold making industry, if they knew that they didn't have that type of support um, for the tool and die mold making industry, it determines whether or not they'll actually retool um, or also get contracts and so forth. It's a whole logistics nightmare when it comes to it. And municipalities have been working on these issues in the airports to be viable, and so this drives them of revenue as well too. So the uncertainty is something we should take from the equation. There just doesn't make any sense right now to have to wait for Nav Canada to do something um, and have to go through the painful process of a full year at least uh, by the appearance of things. We're into six months already. Uh, and then have that uncertainty. Uh, that's a real complication when it comes to local airports. As we talk about a rescue package for the airline industry, how important is it that local airports be a part of that rescue package? Because a lot of us are just talking about Air Canada and yeah. you know, WestJet. How important is it for you know, the small town airports and, you know, the airports in big towns like yours. It's crucial. And um, and, it's, and thank you for that question. It's a great question because if we lose this type of service, then those carriers may not even be interested in flying into those regional airports anyways. So it becomes another complication to the factor of how we actually do some type of a package that's, uh, you know, important for Canadians. So when we've seen right now that Canada is one of the few countries left over, especially in the OECD, because Europe and even the United States have refunded customers. So we're still waiting for what are going to be the net benefits for Canadians. One of them, I would argue, is having our regional airports maintained uh, in those services, especially when you look at we just shift all that traffic onto the highways, like for Windsor, it would be the 401, for example. And if we actually then allow this uncertainty to continue, why reestablish those routes if their insurance costs and other cost factors or reductions are going to make it even more complicated? Because not having the actual the, the air traffic controllers there will also affect the efficiency. So prior to COVID, we had a 300% growth uh, in our regional airport at Windsor. And this, although when we have to build back, would be a big obstacle for planning. So it becomes one of those things over a few jobs, why would we undermine an attempt to rebuild what we've had? So that's one of the reasons, again, why we're just saying, okay, like under COVID, we've seen exceptional circumstances for a whole series of things. And all we're saying right now is basically, let's just put a pause on this right now. Let's put a pause on all these things and make sure that the model that we had that was so successful before can be reinstated as opposed to adding this anomaly of reducing for a few jobs and the consequences we heard from business, we've heard from you know the municipal leaders, we've heard from the public in terms of safety, all those things now become part of the equation. And as you noted, we're waiting for a package from the federal government with regards to that industry. Now this becomes a further complication because those several airports now have to deal with the potential loss of services and the consequences of the services on the airline carriers themselves. Chris? Sorry, go Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chris Reynolds, Canadian Press. Yeah. Just following up on David's initial question there, um, and the required green light from the transport department for any service reduction of a control tower, you mentioned uh, safety considerations and past crashes and incidents in the Detroit-Windsor area. So does that mean you do have some concern about the federal department's judgment of what constitutes safe super, uh, service supervision when it comes to control towers? Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you a reason why is because this was also previously thought of to move the airline industry, the safety management systems, which we have seen has actually been a disaster with regards to the air. So the, the railroad industry with regards to that is self-reporting in that. Um, Peter Julian, uh, our member from Burnaby, uh, New Westminster, uh, and I actually did a hoist motion previously in a previous parliament to delay that, and then that never took place. So um, I do have some concern about that. And with the cutbacks and also the complications under COVID, it's another layer of stress on our already system to do those full evaluations. It's unnecessary stress. Interestingly, with NAV Canada, they, they kind of portrayed themselves as being, you know, very forthright about this issue, but they've actually issued layoff notices. So they basically, the time takes for the union provisions right to when the, it comes to the fruition and get them out the door right away. 
But meanwhile, when I question them, they very laid off thousands of employees and they feel that that didn't have impact their studies whatsoever. So it seems an odd situation going on to begin with at Nav Canada. Um, they have an interesting kind of corporate culture right now that um, they laid out bonuses and laid off players, uh, uh, people at the same time. And there seems to be a problem between them and the friction at uh, Transport Canada. All these things are kind of floating out there. So what I'm suggesting and as a solution is let's just make things simpler right now. Let's just make it simpler. Make sure that the public interest is served in safety not first and foremost. Let's keep the model we have in place, at least for the short term right now, so we don't have these anomalies to factor in as trying to build back the several communities that are now at risk. It, it's something that destabilizes the environment. And again, I can't speak for the other communities that are there. I, I, I know that I've, we've had some course, we've looked correspondence on some issues that we've seen from them. But in Windsor, for example, Economic investment is done through stability, and our competition is not only just within Canada, but also obviously the United States for the auto industry and so forth. And if we actually lose this component, and that's why the automa automakers are supporting this, the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association, if we don't have these pieces of infrastructure necessary to hustle business, so to speak, uh, we lose competition down south. Uh, and that becomes a further complication. And lastly, going back, um, we have shared airspace with Detroit. Um, and it's complicated. It's not only just with their civic aviation, but it's also military. So all these factors create an anxiety and an unease, even in the airport regions um, of living around them and this, the circumferences of where the planes fly. It just seems like a high degree of risk over a few jobs and uncertainty and stress during a time right now that we don't need more of those factors. And that's what the bill is, a simple way to actually move out of that process, provide the safety, security, and the model that's stable so we can try to build back better and not create anxiety and uncertainty during COVID-19. Um, there's been, again, highly more exceptional circumstances that are taking place. And this is just a simple process to allow the minister to say, listen, for a small amount of money that you're looking at here, laying off a bunch of another group of Canadians, especially a high-tech, high-value-added training, and then also creating this extra uncertainty is just a poor decision. Why are we waiting around for that type of analysis? And if the Liberals have any courage with regards to this, they'll seize upon this opportunity and it seize upon the fact that we actually have the votes to help this make a, a reality and get going on it. It's just an unnecessary factor. Regarding pandemic, a potential pandemic relief package, um, do you have any any concerns about the type of aid that might financial aid that might be rolled out to large airlines, for example? Is, is there something like grants that you would not be in favor of as opposed to loan, which you would be uh, assuming that uh, refunds and other stipulations are met? Yeah, no, that's a great question. We're looking at, we'll be really interested in what comes forth. And, and I, you know, I come from the auto sector where in the eight, 1980s, uh, Chrysler received equity uh, support from the federal government at that time. And actually, the federal government made money off of that when it was paid back. Uh, most recently, we had auto loans um, uh, were provided to General Motors and to others. Uh, had we actually kept the shares in General Motors, uh, we would have actually made a lot more money. It was a poor decision by the Harper administration to sell those things. We warned them of that. And now, and ironically, they're moving towards greener and cleaner uh, vehicles and battery and a whole series of things, which we would have held investment shares on. But that's a side tangent. But the point being is we'll be looking at that and seeing what the value out of Canadians get. So the first is we still don't have a lot of Canadians that have been made whole with regards to their ticket prices. And then you have the whole industry behind it. And, uh, and then if there is going to be some type of provision of supports, we'll be looking at the terms and conditions. And again, I, I would think that we've been very clear on that. It's not no CEO bonuses and those types of things. It has to be focused on keeping people employed, uh, workers uh, protected, uh, and employment heightened. Uh, those are the things that we can control. And I would say they're better investments than basically, uh, I was shocked to hear, you know, Bell Canada, for example, you know, made record profits um, during this time. Uh, they've laid off record people uh, with regards to most recent announcements uh, and they also received public money uh, and they also did bonuses. So these are the poor decisions that um, we don't think should be applied to the airline industry but we'll see what happens with the government uh, when they actually put a proposal forward. And I'll check one last time if there is a question on the phone operator. There's no question we'll just have a deadline. I'll just ask this question real quick. Do you see a reason for the House to maybe extend sittings into the summer? Because there seems like there's so much legislation. You have a budget coming. 
That's a great question, and I, we're open to anything as New Democrats. We've always wanted to make Parliament work, and if it means getting results for Canadians, then we're going to be looking at that very seriously, and I can't see where reason why we stand in the way of that. We would certainly be wanting to conclude business. I just came from a you know a committee that's still working on a single line in the criminal code for a single event sports betting, and this has to get through if we're going to have results, and I would certainly, again, uh, be open to all those things because uh, we want to see things happen for Canadians during COVID-19. That's our preoccupation, not an election. Um, and getting things done is certainly important. I would say this in conclusion, though, the government has basically mishandled it, and I've never seen a government um, not put forth the, you know, the legislative agenda uh, in a proper context like this. I mean, there's so much cooperation going on and potential uh, that it's been missed opportunities, but that won't take us away from trying to get results for Canadians because that's what they need right now. That's what them and their families want. This concludes the press conference. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for helping me. Thank you. <laughs>